It's the nation's favourite antiques expert. Yeah! Super cool. How about that? Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners... Yes! ..and valiant losers. Blast it! Will it be the high road to glory... <laughs> ..or the slow road to disaster? Oh, this is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> Not off. A very good morning from the southwest coast of Scotland to seasoned road trippers Paul Laidlaw and Anita Manning. Calm down, Laidlaw. <laughs> You're as high as a kite. <laughs> it's the sea air. It's, it's the sea air. Yes, it's round two of their trip, and excitement abounds. Let me go again, Anita. Uh, leg two, Paul. Leg <laughs> two. You're a wee bit ahead of me. No enough for comfort, though, Anita. <laughs> Last time, Anita increased her £200 pot to £206.64. But it was Paul's auction lots that won the day, and he has £307.50 to spend this time. Still, life's good when you're cruising in a 70s triumph, eh? Thank you. Sorry. Bless you. Gishundite. <laughs> After beginning in Doon, our pair's journey sees them scoot around central Scotland, cross the border to Cumbria, whiz through Lancashire and Yorkshire before a final auction in Newcastle. Today's trip is destined for auction in Hamilton. But they're starting their shopping together in the seaside resort of Largs. This is where, when Glasgow closed in fair fortnight in the 40s and 50s, the whole of Glasgow would sail down here on the puffers and have a wonderful fortnight in all these wee resorts. This is all part of my childhood. Yeah. And the Clyde is the most wonderful river in the world. I'm seeing nothing in here. <laughs> Largs has a historic link with the Vikings, but today our marauders will be plundering the stock of Narducci antiques. What surprises are in store here? Ah, looks like Paul's found something. Oh, my goodness. Behold, 1920s Christmas crackers. A box thereof. Oh, my word. Now, you know what I want to do now? <laughs> what the pull of crap? I want to see what's inside. Oh, look at that. There you have it, with lithographically printed Rococo label there, and this amazing tissue with a glassine paper printed in that uh, slightly art deco, right, for the period. We've got a mixture of aesthetics coming in here, and it's a complete carton. I've not met one yet, but there's got to be a collector of vintage Christmas paraphernalia out there. What would you collect? You'd collect baubles. You would aspire to vintage Christmas crackers, but they will be like hen's teeth, I have no doubt. And here we have some. But what a joy! You've got the packaging, you've got the contents unused, and you have got bucket loads of nostalgia. They're not priced. Let's see what dealer Les can do. Where do you see that, Paul? Where do you, uh, does that sit with I'd, I'd love it to be 15, 20 quid. It's where I'd like it to be. To be honest, I was looking more like 40 quid, Paul, to be honest. Yeah. Any chance at 25 doing it? £25, Paul. Merry Christmas. Tremendous. Thank you very much. The crackers leave Paul with around £280. Let's hope they go off with a bang at auction. <laughs> Talking of crackers, here's Anita. <laughs> Looks like she's found something shiny. Silver-plated tea services are a little out of fashion today, but I like this one. A Victorian bachelor's tea service, so-called because it's meant for one person. It was made in Glasgow, retailed at Edwards & Sons. This was a prestigious retailer who sold quality items. What we see is a high degree of decoration and embossed work. We have the teapot and we have the sugar and we have the cream. 
If it's not too dear, I think I'd like to have a go at it. Good idea. Let's get the dealer. Hey, Franco? Hi, Anita. Have you found something of interest? Yes, Good, yes. good, good. I'm pleased. And I think that that's awfully nice. To you, Anita, I'll do that £65. Let's inspect the sugar bowl and the milk jug, eh? See, I like the fact that even in the base of it, we have this wonderful engraved work mm -hmm. here. It's lovely, lovely. It's quality. It is, without question, without question. Could I buy it at £40? 40 pounds? 45 Go on, I know you can. <laughs> Who could resist oh, you, Franco? Thank you, thank 45, you. 45, 45. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> That's you, wonderful. You, and the bachelor tea service is hers. Well done, that woman. First item bought, but there's still plenty more in here that I might have a go at. So, one item each, and they've not finished here yet. Paul, I think that colour would suit you. Let me see. That would, that would suit me in the dark. Let me see. You could do a fair paddy bar in that outfit. Paddy bar? There's no time for Scottish dancing, kilt or no kilt. I would... I would turn more heads just with that. <laughs> oh, my giddy want. Nobody needs to see that. There's a thought that's indelibly branded in your memory. He's bragging again. Behave yourself, Laidlaw. Time to look for more goodies. Who'll spot what, where, when, now? My word. OK. This is a sophisticated toy. Steam-powered, no less. Uh, what do you get for your money? We've got a beautiful tin plate hull, but rather nicely decorated and named. The vessel is the Princess Pat. That is scarce, attractive, in fact, downright desirable. Uh, am I going to get that? I doubt it. Because do you know what? In this environment, they know the worth of this toy. Priced at £280, it's at market value, so little chance of a profit. On your brows, Paul. Les, let me show you this. Anita on the way here was waxing lyrical about the Glasgow trade weekends and going down the water and the steamers to uh, Largs and so on. And what you need to get on your boat, but a ticket, and there they are, a wee raft of tickets, Clyde Coast Services Limited. All the different prices. Four pence return. I've got to have a go at that, because I want to see the look in her face. Paul's very drawn to the nautical today. Uh, what would buy it? Why don't we just go £10? Oh, why don't we? How's that? So on. Just a ticket. Just a ticket. Just a ticket. <laughs> right then, settle up and uh, all aboard. All aboard. How about rush? Because I genuinely do have a boat to catch. A boat to catch on a road trip? Oh, exciting. Meanwhile, back with Anita, and, oh, it's another shiny thing. <laughs> Isn't this an interesting piece of mid-20th century design? This is an ornamental table lighter for cigars and cigarettes, once a common sight in homes, restaurants and bars. Today, they have collector's appeal. It has a, a Swedish minimalist look about it. No name on the bottom. And let's have a wee look here. No, it's made in Japan. So it's a copy of a Scandinavian design. This is a pretty cool item, but I wouldn't want to be paying more than, say, £10 for it. Let's see what Franco says. Franco, I'd, I'd like to pay you for my lovely wee tea set, okay. but I spotted this down there. I'd like to perhaps buy it, though. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't like to pay any more than about £10 for it. Give me £15 for it, since it's you. Could you come to 12 Uh-oh. Go on, go on. Since, right. since it's you, since it's you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank pleasure, you. pleasure. Cheeky. That's £57 in total for the bachelor tea service and the table lighter, and Anita's bagged her first two items. I'm happy with these. Good. Thank you very much again, Franco. No, it's pleasure as always. to see you. You too, you too. And I wish you well with them. Bye-bye, Franco. Bye-bye. Back with Paul, and he has his little overseas trip planned. He's popping across to Rothsay on the Isle of Butte. It's just a half-hour ferry ride from Weems Bay. Lucky thing. 
This is fantastic. I'm on the water. The sun is shining. My chariot's down there. Yeah, this is what it's all about. Land ahoy, Paul. The seaside town of Rothsay boasts a romantic bay and a rich Victorian heritage. Palm trees, blue water, blue skies, big cotton roll clouds. And we're still in Scotland. <laughs> still loving the triumph, but loving it all the more with the top down. It's what the Scots call a taps off day, I believe. Paul's visiting West Bay Homes, an antiques emporium, a relative newbie on the Butte antiques scene. It's owned by Neville. What treasures can Pirate Paul find? What do you think of this? Yikes. It literally is a strange beast. What's it made of? Well, that is salt glazed, possibly fire clay. And what does it represent is that uh, a wild man of the woods? It's certainly a grotesque visage. 65 pounds worth of grotesque visage is that. On we browse them. Earlier, I bought an instant collection of vintage transport tickets. Yep, I remember. Maybe lacks a little oomph at auction. What would I like to do? Grow that lot. Now, what would be the theme? The theme would be transport, and I may have found two objects that would work particularly well in combination with the tickets. First, a little piece that takes me home almost, Crutchley's Railway and Telegraphic County Map of Westmoreland. OK, that's Lake District Territory. This is early. I think this dates to 1850 or 1860, and it's a little joy. Have a look at this. What do you think of that? A little tinted and engraved map, and it's a little joy of cartography and engraving. I like that very much. If you reside in the county of Cumbria, that'll look nice framed on your wall. If you collect railway anna or maps, there is something that may fill a hole, but it gets better. Oh, do tell. What do you think of this? 1920s, Robert Stevenson, Locomotive Builders of Darlington. This is notes and illustrations of recent work. What were they producing in 1922? Well, they were producing those big boys' toys indeed. My word, what a lovely publication. And if you get all hot and sweaty over railway locomotives, and there's plenty of the big little boys that do, I'll wager that is a good night in. Problem is, no idea what these are going to cost. So I shall have to ask, is Neville about? Neville? Yes, Paul. How are you doing? All right. Good. Look what I found. Expensive or not? Not particularly. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as long as a piece of string, really. Um, cheap. How would £12 suit you? You don't haggle on prices like that. No, you don't. Smashing. Paul's new collection of transport tickets and railway armour is complete. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Neville. All, All right. the best. Thank you. Bye. And just in time for the next ferry back to the mainland. Meanwhile, Cumnock in Ayrshire is Anita's next pit stop. She's come to find out about a remarkable heavy horse, first bred nearly 300 years ago. Known as the workhorse of the world, Clydesdale horses were one of Scotland's greatest exports. Hugely sought after, they were shipped as far and wide as Australia, New Zealand and North America. Renowned for their size, strength and gentle temperament, they all originate from one small corner of southwest Scotland. Maggie, Clydesdale's <laughs> my favourite, favourite breed of horse. What's this one? This is name? Maytime. She's lovely. She is. She's the star of the farm. Ah, oh, she's absolutely. Hello, Maytime. 
Clydesdales are draft horses, bred to pull heavy loads and work the land, but for centuries before, other animals were used. Oxen were the first in the early 16th, 17th century. Then they moved into draft horses, who were more intelligent and they could do multitask jobs. In the mid-18th century, Britain was becoming an industrial superpower with ever-growing demands on production. The sixth Duke of Hamilton, a wealthy land and coal mine owner, was looking for a draft horse with supreme pulling power to transport increasingly heavy loads of coal and work tirelessly in the fields. Thanks to him, the horse he envisioned became a reality. They brought in Flemish stallions and they bred with a Scottish mare and that produced the Clydesdale. All right. Um, and it became known as the Clydesdale because it was done in the Clydesdale Valley, which is now Lanark. The new super-strong Clydesdale horses became indispensable and their reputation quickly spread. Their good nature and versatility meant that they also became a common sight in cities, carting everything from milk to beer and farm produce. At its peak, Scotland alone had 140,000 Clydesdales and over 1,500 stallions were exported in one year. Wow. This magnificent beast. This is, is Alfie. Hello, Alfie. Alfie. Come in and see him. <laughs> he is a huge beast. How, how much does Alfie weigh? Alfie here is over a ton. Over a ton? Over a ton. <laughs> wow. He, Clydesdales have a white blaze and they have finer features on their face than like the Shire or the Persian or the he other heavier horses. And they always have feathers on their feet. But the Clydesdales have feet like dinner plates. Well, it must be so, expensive uh, shoeing them. <laughs> shoeing them is very expensive. So here we've got a couple of shoes. So we've got a Clydesdale shoe here, which is off one of the boys here. Wow. And then we've got a standard horse shoe here. There is some difference. There's a big difference. Yeah. These are big boys. They're big boys. And yeah. girls. And girls, of course. <laughs> At Blackstone Farm, the gentle giants are mainly used for fun. Up you get, the Anita. Dear, oh dear. Oh, this is great. <laughs> oh, this is fabulous. I'm so happy. <laughs> right, we'll Thank see you, you later. Good <laughs> time. Oh, 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 we're away. <laughs> oh, wow. By the 1920s, the increase in motor vehicles meant a steady decline in the need for Clydesdales, and numbers waned. This Scottish horse breed, once exported world over, is now endangered. There's actually not that many of them left. They're, they call them a category three, an endangered list, right? And we're trying to bring them in so that people can ride and drive them. Anita, I think it's your turn for a wee show. What oh, do you think? Oh, I would love there that. You are. I would Run love you go. it. Up Let's there, Alfie. Up there. That's a fast trot, isn't That's it? That's it, <laughs> Up there, laddie. It's amazing the ground you can cover, actually, oh, in a yeah. short time. I think she's got the hang of this, you know. Giddy up. That's you. Ah, good boy. Over that's where we've been. That's you. That's you. Up, Alfie. That's you. Up, Alfie. No problem. <laughs> John, I've had a wonderful day learning all about these splendid creatures. It's been the best ever, and you know what I've loved? Learning how to drive Alfie. What a busy and memorable day. Happy size all round, eh? Nighty night, Anita. There she goes. Nighty night, Paul. There he goes. Well, there we go. Good morning! The dawn has broken, but so have the clouds. It may be raining out there, but there's sunshine in our hearts. <laughs> she loves her own joke. Yesterday, Paul sailed through the shopping. Literally, he bought a collection of transport tickets and railway armour and some vintage Christmas crackers. Just a ticket. Or the cracker. And, he uh, has £260.50 oh. left in his wallet. Anita bought a bachelor's tea service and a table lighter. I think I'd like to have a go at it. She has £149 and 64 pence to play with. I thought that was a honey. It's a sheep. <laughs> I thought that was a Shetland pony. <laughs> She's learning. <laughs> it's going to be that sort of day, you know. Right, the rain's off, but the shopping's back on, and Paul's been dropped off in Coat Bridge. He's continuing his antiques trawl in used furniture fusion, 
which is packed with the weird and the wonderful. What will Paul go for? Perhaps both. That is an original hand-carved piece of Inuit art. And look at it. There you have your, your hunter with his bone harpoon. And for my money, that's exquisite. That is good work. This figure is carved from black argolite stone. Now, what I'd like to know is the name of the artist. And commonly, it's marked on the base. Now, there was once a label there, long gone, but I'm not going to be able to pursue that any further. But do I like it? Abs do you like it? I think that's absolutely lovely. A romantic piece. Any other members of the Inuit family here? And bingo. There you have it. I think that's a little Inuit child. Distinctive green stone, almost like a, a jadeite. And look underneath, what do you have there? Just simply scratched in. We've got, I can't read that, but there's the name of the artist. Uh, there's an abbreviated date there, 81. So this is, this will soon be 40 years old. Am I interested in buying these? I'd happily put my name to them. The child carving is made from green serpentine, but there are no ticket prices. Best get dealer Rob on board. Rob, where do you get all the Inuit sculptures? Well, this is some that I picked up on my travels, I think it was one of the auctions I went to. Um, there wasn't an auction in the Arctic then? No, sadly. <laughs> sadly it wasn't. I like the hunter. OK. Uh, and I like, there's a, I think a wee child in like a green stone. Yes. What would, what would those two be? I could do the two of those for six pounds. This conversation just ended Excellent. with a handshake. Deal. Spot on. It's a deal, all right, but Paul's not finished in here just yet. Oh, no. Great there stuff. you go. Excellent, thank you very much. Right. I will keep looking. I'll get these for you. Anita, meanwhile, has headed to Motherwell with just under £150 in her purse. As luck would have it, the Greenside Garden Centre has an antique shop. Time to do some digging, girl. I found an interesting 17th century book by James Howell. Now, James Howell was a writer and historian from Wales, and this is a rare first edition book of his, which is giving us proverbs, or old said savvies and adages in various different languages, and I believe that this was the first book to relay the proverb, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This book is 595. That's a lot of money. Can't play with this any longer. I have to get on with the work. Yes, you do that. Back in Copebridge and Paul's with his new pal, Dealer Rob. What's the chat, chaps? You and I both know yes. that on that table full of china, for want of a better yes. term, there's one standout Little piece. Little corker, yes. Because everyone can tell for a hundred paces that that, that is... Clarice Cliff. Clarice Cliff. Absolutely. Yeah. Art Deco artist Clarice Cliff is one of the most important ceramicists of the 20th century. So this little mustard pot has collector appeal. Small, very distinctive geometry. Yes. I think this might be bonjour pattern. Uh, and the decoration, not another crocus. No. Crinoline no. lady. It's nice, it's attractive. But what a little cracker. Yeah. But speaking of cracks... Yes. It knobs at a funny angle, is it? Knobs that been off? It has, uh, and at some point in its history, it's, it's had a little uh, nibble. A while ago, but yes. otherwise... So there we go. Uh, part of the bizarre range, so 1930s, 1935. Does the price reflect? I mean, I'd, I'm where, breaking a gold rule of mine. Yeah. Where would you be, considering...? Dirt cheap is where I would be. Right. What do you I think? Mean, I don't know, 10 or 20 quid. Mm -hmm. Is that...? The 20 is more... Appealing. Yeah. Yes. I can see yes. it from your side of the Absolutely. fence. Absolutely. Um, you know what I'm going to say. Maddo Diddo? Yeah. Is it doable? Deal, yeah. It's worth a punt at that. Good man. One £15 deal, 
two more lots bagged and £139.50 left in the kitty. Sweet. <laughs> See you later. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Back in Motherwell, and Anita's found a man. Who's he? I have been wandering around this antique centre looking at lovely jewellery, lovely ceramics and lovely silver. But that guy's eyes have been following me everywhere I go. This portrait has been painted by Andrew Law. Andrew Law studied at Glasgow School of Art where he subsequently taught, so he's not just a gifted amateur. This is a portrait of John Henry Kearney, Esquire, JP. It was done in October the 15th, 1948. Now, he was provost of Kilmarnock at that time. This picture came through my auction at one point and didn't make an awful lot of money. But I suppose, for me, he has a certain charm. The only thing is, are buyers interested in a portrait of a dignified official from the 1940s. Hmm. Is Anita tempted to escort this old geezer out of the garden centre? Here's dealer Alan to help. I've had a great look around, uh -huh. but as I've wandered around, that guy's eyes have been following me. <laughs> Portraits aren't the most popular things. Right. But I'd like to buy it. I'd like to pay around about £60. Is that at all possible? I've spoken to the dealer about the price on that one. I know you do a very good price for it. He can do 60 Can he do 60 He'll do that for you, yeah. Oh, I'm delighted. Yeah. <laughs> You're coming with me, all promise. Yourself. You're coming to Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Put it there. That's lovely. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. I think Anita's actually quite smitten to a pin-up. She now has just under £90 left to spend and one John Henry Kearney Esquire to keep her company in the Triumph. OK, John, off to Hamilton. Buckle up. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Paul's taking a detour from shopping and is headed to West Calder. He's here to find out about the iconic Great Highland bagpipe. David McMurchy, who's known as Blue, is one of the few traditional bagpipe makers. The first Australian to get a pipe major's certificate after joining the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards in the 70s, Blue lives and breathes bagpipes. Hello there, is it Blue? It certainly is. Oh, it's Paul. Good to see you, sir. Nice to meet you. All right then. I'll just turn this off so we can hear ourselves speak. What did I interrupt you doing there, Blue? Well, I'm actually making a part for a bagpipe. Of course, I think of Scotland when I think of the pipes, but pipes are used throughout the world. What do we know of the origin of the pipes into Scotland? Well, there's a f quite a number of stories. Some say that the Romans brought them over and so forth, um, and others say that uh, they think it was during the Crusades when the armies all went through from Europe out to the Middle East where they had primitive bagpipes, and then, of course, came back and started building their own type of design. Whatever the origins, bagpipes are found around the world. And the Great Highland Bagpipe has close associations with the military. After the Jacobite Risings, a number of regiments in the late 18th century revived a tradition of pipers playing their comrades into battle, a practice which continued into the First World War. So what's the function of the pipes in the army? Well, one of the functions was to rally the tr uh, troops as a bit of a, a signalling uh, mechanism. Uh, tunes so you know you're going to advance, or tunes if you know you're going to retreat, and of course the pipes being loud, you could hear it. Before starting his business, Blue played all round the world, and his love of the bagpipes is all down to his Scottish granddad. And my grandfather started teaching me when I was 12. I just put on some overalls and went and worked with in Grandad's shed and learnt the basics of wood turning and, and oh. pipe making. My father yep. did pipe making and bag making and repairs and, and so forth, so yeah, it was in the blood. Bagpipes have many different component parts. From the hardwood pipes to the bag, which traditionally was made from animal skin turned inside out, the pipes attached where the legs and neck would be. 
That looks like an ancient set there. Yeah, it certainly is. These, these were made a, number of, a couple of hundred years ago. In this case, we've got horn there. So they've used anything that's been a hard material to stop the wood splitting. And to be honest with you, uh, the sound would frighten you at times. I've tried playing these and that would knock the birds out of the trees, to be honest with you. Well, we'll not put that to the test then, but we will put Paul to the test. Back to the lathe in the workshop. I'm not as smooth as you. I've heard that said before. <laughs> Pretty satisfying though, isn't it? Right. A right. Take a bigger bite. There. I'll make a, a pipe maker out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's looking pretty good. I think what we'll do is we'll switch off the machine and just check uh, your handiwork. Will Paul's work pass muster? It's looking pretty good to me. And you can see the beauty of the wood coming yeah, right yeah, out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just take that out and have a, a wee look. Yeah, obviously a long way to go because it has to have the, you know, that part rounded as well and then the hole drilled through it. And then we take it to the finishing lathe and that's when it gets all the, uh, you know, all the patterns and so forth. And I think we've got one here, a, a finished one. Uh, what sort of manner goes into a set of pipes? Well, a basic set will take you 30, uh, about 36 hours. Now, if you've got a set with, say, silver on, then you've got to take into account the hours that the silversmith has spent you know, making up the shape of the mounts and doing the hand engraving, which can take weeks. But that instrument could be here in a couple of hundred years' time. Well, hopefully yes, but I, I don't think we'll be here to <laughs> prove it right or wrong, you know? Blue, that has been enlightening and fascinating. If you'd like to follow me, we'll go and have a listen. Playing music composed by Blue on a set of pipes he recently finished is local piper Callum Watson. That is nothing like the pipes. You're quite right. Providing they're well made, well tuned, and well played. And I think we ticked all those boxes today. I like to think so. Yep. You're a gentleman, sir. Thank you very much. Thank that you. was wonderful. Thank you. Meanwhile, Anita's off to Wishaw with a smidgen under £90. And lo and behold, it's another garden centre. This one. Gary and Bridges has over a hundred antiques dealers under its roof. Let's hope Anita can pull out a few plums or onions. I'm always attracted to things which have to do with desks and writing. And I think that this little desk calendar is a lovely wee thing. It's probably from the 1930s or the 1940s. The base is made of onyx and the calendar mechanism is coated with brass. We have two wheels at either side which shows the date. The condition is perfect. But for me, the most important thing here is this tiny wee price of £10. I think that there's a little profit left in that, so I'm just going to go and buy it. Greg. Hello. In this centre, you have something for everyone. <laughs> and there is such a wide variety. This, from expensive down to a lovely little thing like that. It's only £10, but I fell in love with it. Very nice. So, can I have that? You can, please? you can, yes. Very charming item of yesteryear at a good price. Well done. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> That's everyone's shopping done. Hip, hip, hurrah. Time to reunite the friendly rivals. You're going to need luck in Hamilton. You and I, <laughs> we don't need We make our own oh. luck in here. Like two old hens, aren't they? Better get some shut-eye. Rise and shine, everyone. It's auction day. Yes, our happy shoppers have tootled round the Firth of Clyde, headed inland and are now in Hamilton. L.S. Smiley Auctions were established way back in 1874. Today, they're bang up to date with online and telephone bids, adding to the excitement. We've got some nice and varied items. 
and I hope I win today. Oh, I was, I was, I was away you there for a minute, and uh -huh. it all went sour. <laughs> ha, ha. Anita spent £127 on four lots, including the bachelor tea service. Oh, I'll tell you what, you can serve me breakfast in bed from this any day you like. I adore this. The aesthetic is pin sharp. And what I particularly like is this border here of zodiacal signs. And I wonder if her stars are going to be lucky for her today. Paul spent a somewhat thrifty £68, also on four lots, including the transport tickets and railway honour. It doesn't look like much, but it's part of railway history. And those people who are interested in railway honour, and there are plenty of them, will be after this lot. He paid £22 for it. Might be just a wee touch too much, but I can see why he bought them. What wisdom can auctioneer Jim Henderson impart? Andrew Law painting, um, very well done. We've not had that artist before, so um, we'll see how it goes. 1920s crackers, never been used. Where do you find an item like that? 20, 30 pounds, something like that. Should do more. Right, folks, grab a seat. It's busy. Packs room, all <laughs> packs room. There's no hiding in this room either, no is there? <laughs> Let the bidding begin. Anita's table lighter is her first lot. At 20 on bed, at 20 bed, two now, straight in front at 22 yeah, bed. Go, yeah. At 22, at 22 bed, two at four now, at 24, six and eight, at 20, 30, at 30 bed, five, at 35, at 35 bed now, at the back of the steel room, at 35 oh, bed, at 35 and five, at 35 and five, at 35 and five, down, at 35 pounds. That is a wholesome profit. Great. Very good. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I should think so. Paul's Inuit carvings are next under the hammer. Double your money. Better than that. Anything. I mean, margin's OK. Nice work, and Paul's inched in front by a pound. Fine and dandy. A good buy. It's Anita's bachelor tea service next. Milk and two for me, please. At 20 on bed, at 20 bed two, four, six, at 26, and eight, at 20, 30 now, at 35, and 40, and 40 bed on the left at 40. Come on. Five now, yes, ready five. Five. 50, and five, at 55, sweet front, at 55, 60, at 60 on bed, at 60, at 60, you put out, at 60, at 60 birds. She's stolen the lead. Happy? Do I eat this? I'm happy. <laughs> good, good, good. Next, are there surprises in store for Paul's vintage Christmas crackers? Ten pounds out of ten. At ten on the ten. That should be going to be slow burner like others. Six, eight, at eighteen bit, twenty nine. And two, at 22, four, at 24, at 24, at 24, six now, at 26, eight now, at the second, at 20, 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 all eyes are on Anita's next lot, the Lord Provost's portrait. One hundred, our one hundred defeated. Still claiming, still going. Our one hundred for it now. Are we all done at one hundred? And one hundred pounds. Ha! He's a winner, not a loser. Keeping Anita ahead. 
it was a punt really. Uh, and a hundred pounds probably okay for it. Next lot, Paul's collection of transport tickets and railway honour. Let's get these journeys started, okay? Started at Let's 10. hope it's not just one stop. At 10 bit, surely more folks at 10, at 10 after 10 at 12 now, at 12, 14, at 14, 16, at 16 bit, at 16 bit, 14 now. Is this guaranteed? I think maybe it is. I think it's going to stop. At 16 bit, 16 bit, 18, at 18, at 20 bit, 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 at 20 First loss of the day, too bad. Oof, that's all right. Skin of my teeth, really. <laughs> Renita's desk calendar is her last lot. What's it worth? 30 pounds for the 30. 20 can I, can I echo? 10 men, 10 on bed, 10 on 10 on bed, 10 12. Some girls are going to take a shame, man. 60, and 8, 20, and 2, and 22, 4, and 24 bed. At 24 for it now, at 24, at 24 bed, in the room at 24, at 24 pounds. Well done, and she's gained even more ground. It only doubled its money. <laughs> I'm happy, I'm happy. Paul's tiny Claris Cliff mustard pot is his final shot at glory. 50, 30 is 50 in the bank, at 50, 5, 40, at 40, at the back of the serum, 45 online, and 50 in the back of the serum, 55 online. Come on, that's better again. 60, and 5, at 65, 70, and 70, 5 now, and 80, and 80 in the room, and 80, 5 now, guys. Oh, internet's hanging on in there. Oof, the slogan, mate. And 80 bed, and 90 under 5. At 95, 100. At 100. Well, it's, at 100 it's a good at plan. 100 yeah. the at 100 pounds. Wow, that's what I call a last hurrah. But has it won the day? I'm not yeah, sure. You've been steadier than me, I think. Right. right. Calculator time, is it? Yep. So, let's do the maths. Anita has added to her piggy today. After auction has costs, she made a profit of a little over £50. It means she takes almost £260 into the next leg. Well done. While Paul has further increased his lead, after commission, he made nearly £78 profit today. Well done, that man. You've got over £385 in your piggy to splash next time. Seems to be fattening up nicely. You're still a wee bit ahead of me. Sadly, just a wee bit is yeah. all I'm hearing. Aye, but we've got three to go, so it's... Game on, Anita Manning. Let's go. <laughs>